Every good novel has a beginning that serves as the, the cornerstone or the foundation for this storyline. The building blocks are added. They include things like intrigue, drama, humor, love won, or love lost. Every invention that we have benefited from, every invention that we have enjoyed is a result of the spark of imagination or perhaps of a felt need. There was, there was some need and someone said, oh, I think I know how to fix that. Betty Nesmith and her husband divorced after he returned from World War II. In the early 1950s, her father passed away and left her some property in Dallas. She was living in San Antonio with her son. So she, her son, her sister, and her mother moved to Dallas. To support herself as a single, single mother, she took a job as a secretary at the Texas Bank and Trust. Through a lot of hard work and diligence, she moved to the level of executive secretary, the highest position that a woman could hold in the bank at that time. It was difficult to erase mistakes made on an electric typewriter. Some of us remember those things. And while they were useful, it was hard to, to correct anything. In order to make extra money, Betty, during the holidays, would paint holiday scenes on the bank windows. So she was an artist. And she began to think about it. She said, with lettering, an artist never corrects by erasing, but always paints over the error. So I decided to use what artists use. I put some tempera water-based paint in a bottle and took my watercolor brush to the office. And she began painting over her mistakes. Well, she worked with her son's high school teacher, a science teacher, to try to improve on this. And it got better and better. And some of her supervisors were sort of telling her she shouldn't do this, but she found that a lot of the other secretaries were coming to her wanting this correct out or paint out as they called it. Well, she began marketing this typewriter correction fluid as Mistake Out in 1956. The, later, the name was later changed to Liquid Paper when she started her own company. And the product became a very indispensable tool in the secretarial trade. In 1979, Betty Nesmith sold Liquid Paper to the Gillette Corporation for $47.5 million. 47.5 in 1979. That was a good sum of money. That's good now. <laughs> and uh, Betty, Betty did all right for herself. She had the one son, the one child. He had a bit of fame, notoriety himself as a musician and producer, Michael Nesmith of the Monkees. There was a need, and Betty Nesmith discovered a solution. She found a beginning for something that wound up being quite a profitable venture for her. For Christians, the three words in the beginning are the cornerstone for our faith and our future. There have been a number of events in the last couple of weeks and it's just prompted me that these are some things that we need to, to preach about, to hear about, because there's some things going on in the Christian world and in the world in, in general that are disturbing. It's a trend that is dangerous. So we're going to spend a, a few weeks just talking about what we as Southern Baptists believe. What is it that, that our foundation of faith is based upon? These beliefs, these essentials are contained in a document called the Baptist Faith and Message. These are the things that we believe. These are the building blocks of our faith. Without them, the basis for our personal and corporate belief system, we have traded in the words in the beginning for once upon a time. So this is where we begin. What are the things that we believe? If you look at the Baptist faith and message, now I'm going to get copies, little pocket-sized copies for everyone. But the very first section deals with the scriptures. Today we're going to talk about what we believe in terms of the scriptures. Let me read you the opening paragraph from the Baptist faith and message. The Holy Bible is written by men who were divinely influenced. The Holy Bible is God's explaining himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine teaching. God is the author. Salvation is its purpose. Truth without any mistakes is its substance. 
For these reasons, all Scripture is completely true. All Scripture is completely correct. It tells the main beliefs that God uses to judge us. It is the true center of Christianity. It will remain the center of Christianity until the end of the world. It is the most excellent ideal. It is with this ideal that all human behavior, all statements of belief, and all religious opinions should be tested. All scripture is proof of the Christ. Christ is the center of divine revelation. In other words, we believe the Bible. We believe God's word to be infallible and inerrant. No mistakes, no errors, no blunders, no inaccuracies. Apparently, though, not all people who profess to be Christians have a similar belief. Christian musicians Michael and Lisa Gungor, they have a group called Gungor. Their band has won Dove Awards for Christian music. They made headlines last week with their denial of the, of the accuracy of the inerrancy of Scripture in Genesis. Michael clarified in a post that he added last week. These, this, the first three words are all caps in his blog. No reasonable person takes the entire Bible completely literally. No reasonable person takes the entire Bible completely literally, according to Michael Gungor. Well, in a response blog on August 8th, Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis, he said, Of course, that is a misrepresentation of those of us who believe in the complete inerrancy of the Bible. When we take the Bible literally, we are reading it in what is called a natural manner. Recognizing that the Psalms, for example, are poetry, that there are parables in the Bible, and so on. But neither Michael Gungor nor his wife Lisa are Bible scholars. They're not scientists either. Michael studied jazz guitar in college. She studied music at Oral Roberts University. But they write as though they know more than the people who spent their entire lives studying the Bible and proving the inerrancy of the Bible. In part of his blog, Michael used a bit of a mocking tone to discount the accuracy of the Bible. He said, do I believe that God literally drowned every living creature 5,000 years ago in a global flood, a global flood, except the ones who were living in a big boat? No, I don't. Why don't I? Because of science and rational thought. That's dangerous. Science and rational thought are now causing him to discount what God has told us in the book of Genesis. Rational thought, that's his basis. But Michael's own words provide inconsistencies and irrational thoughts. He says, I have no more ability to believe, for example, that the first people on earth were a couple named Adam and Lee, Eve that lived 6,000 years ago. I have no ability to believe that there was a flood that covered all the highest mountains in the world only 4,000 years ago, and that all the animal species that exist today are here because they were carried on an ark and then somehow walked or flew all around the world from a mountain in the Middle East after the water dried up. He said he has no more ability to believe in these things than I do to believe in Santa Claus. Dangerous words. Michael avows that he is still inspired by the person of Christ. Even challenging those who have criticized him for this blog by saying that there's much work to be done together in the name of Christ and in the love of Christ. The Bible. Is it fact or fiction? Young Gore believes in Christ, his resurrection, and his death. Or so Michael says. But if he believes in Christ, if he believes in Jesus, does he believe what Jesus believed? Southern Baptists do. We believe in the Bible. The Holy Bible is God's explaining himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine teaching. God is the author. Salvation is its purpose. 
truth without any mistakes is its substance. For these reasons, all Scripture is completely true. All Scripture is completely correct. That's the basis for our beliefs. We believe the Bible to be inerrant. No mistakes, no boo-boos. We definitely believe in the words of our Savior. Michael and Lisa now view the account of Genesis of Adam and Eve as myth. Jesus, on the other hand, he says he believes in Jesus. Okay. But Jesus says something that contradicts what Michael and Lisa believe about Adam and Eve. In Matthew 19, verses 3 through 5, Jesus spoke to God's creation of man and woman. Some Pharisees approached him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. How could you supposedly believe in Jesus? How can you align a belief in Jesus and his commandment to love your neighbor as yourself but then discount what he says about God's creation of Adam and Eve? If I believe that Jesus gave this commandment and I'm supposed to do that, then why wouldn't I believe what he said about Adam and Eve as God's creation? Is Jesus a liar? Were only part of the things he said true? Do we accept some and discount the others, ignore them? Because we've decided those are lies. That's a myth. If my Savior said it, I believe it. I'm not going to question God. I'm not here to at all discount anything that Jesus spoke while he walked this earth. Michael and Lisa no longer accept the biblical account of Noah, the ark, and the flood as fact. They say they believe in Jesus, yet they ignore Jesus' words about Noah, the ark, and the flood as found in Luke 17, verses 26 and 27. Jesus said, just as it was in the days of Noah, so, is it, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Believe in Jesus! But not about Noah and the ark and the flood. Jesus talked about it, but I don't, I don't know. I don't buy into that. How do you align? How do you try to make those two match up? Michael and Lisa seem to have done so. If you doubt what Jesus says in this passage, how can you then accept as factual anything that Jesus said? You either take Jesus wholly at his word, or you don't. No picking and choosing, no arbitrary acceptance or rejection. You're either all in or all out when we talk about Jesus. In Luke 21, 33, the Lord says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Michael and Lisa seem to miss this passage. Modern convenience and enlightenment do not discount the Bible. Nor do they diminish Jesus' teaching, including his references to Old Testament scriptures. In Luke 24, 44, after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples, to his apostles. And he certainly made his effort to calm them. And then, verse 44, then he told them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So he's given credence to Old Testament writing as he speaks these words to his disciples and his apostles. They say the words have to be fulfilled. God ordained that his words should be captured and compiled for a specific reason. Now Jesus, Jesus had prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed for his followers saying this, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Your word is is truth. But not all of it is truth for Michael and Lisa. In Romans 15, 4, God spoke again. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. 
Do we not get hope and encouragement from Old Testament writings? It's the foundation for everything that follows in the New Testament. If you want to discount that, if you want to eliminate that, if you want to ignore that, then the New Testament becomes worthless. It's not worth the paper it's printed on, if that's the, choose, the path that you choose. How can anyone be instructed when they choose to ignore the teachings? If you're not aware of what happened in the beginning, the context and the relevance of what happens later is totally lost. Its significance is shattered. Its truths are tarnished. Determining exactly what Michael and Lisa Gungor believe is difficult. Their views seem to be like a small boat being tossed about in a raging storm. They have nothing to anchor to. Their group, Gungor, released an EP, a short album, named God the Mother. Remember now, I'm saying... They don't seem to have an anchor to hold on to. They released this album titled God the Mother. They have a song in there by the same name. The lyrics evolve. Part of the lyrics go, and they go from this, God is not my father. And that's repeated a few times. And then it advances to God is not, not my father. And they defend their lyrics by saying that seeing God only as the father is like experiencing the daytime without ever experiencing the night. The problem is that their theology is flawed when measured against the words of Christ, whom they say they believe in. In the 11th chapter of Luke, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray as his disciples, as John had taught his disciples. In Luke 11, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Mother was not mentioned. Mom was not included. Mama was not part of the teaching. Father. Only Father. Please understand me. My message today is not an attack on Michael and Lisa Gungo or any others who, because of science and rational thought, have now decided that some parts of the scripture are simply fairy tales good words to learn from but not factual events that occurred for those who feel that God's word is nothing more than a compilation of fact and fiction truth and tales certainty and certainly not they're off base this message today is remind us that we as Southern Baptists are solidly anchored in God's inspired and inerrant word. The words in the beginning offer the starting point for the universe, for this solar system, for life, for your life, and for mine. As you continue through God's words, you move from the details of the beginning to the description and the details of the end. Heaven or hell. There's no ambiguity, no murkiness, no questions there. But here's the danger. Here's the challenge when we think about Michael and Lisa Gungor, Christian artist, Dove Award winning artist. And people are going to look up to them. They have influence on those who hear their music. And the message they send is a flawed message. It is a message straight from Satan. My next door neighbor was talking with me after we got back Thursday evening. And they are from mid part of Kentucky, small town. And she was talking about that in their small town, 12 to 1500 people, there was the town drunk. If you've ever lived in a small town, you, you know you know everyone, you know everyone's business, you know who's the town drunk, who's the bootlegger, who does what, you, you know all these things. The town drunk. Well, his mom and dad both were taken ill and had to be hospitalized for a period of time and then had to move to a step-down unit for a brief period of time. 
The town drunk's brother goes to the, the step-down unit to pick mom and dad up to bring them home. And when they roll up to the house, there's a truck backed up to mom and dad's house. And someone is loading furniture because the town drunk has stolen and sold the furniture while they're in the hospital. When you tell someone that parts of the Bible are a lie, they're a myth, they're simply a story, you're stealing from them. You're stealing the inerrancy of God's Word. Because if I start questioning Genesis, I start questioning Noah, I start questioning Adam and Eve, then why wouldn't I also question Jesus? His virgin birth. His death and resurrection. His promise to come and have us join Him in heaven. Why wouldn't I question it all if I questioned that? And if you have a platform and you say, I don't believe in the stories of Genesis, you're stealing heaven from people. And we know what the Scriptures say about those who become a stumbling block. That it's better if a millstone is tied around your neck and you're thrown into the ocean. Michael and Lisa and others like them who now have, because of science and rational thought, begun to say that, well, not all of this is true. They will answer to God for it one day. We, as Southern Baptists, we believe the Bible. God is the author. Salvation is its purpose. Truth without any mistakes is its substance. For these reasons, all Scripture is completely true. All Scripture is completely correct. That's our foundation. Our Christian world, some people crumble when they are faced with the outside pressures. And it's Christianity light. Be careful as you listen to others and as you talk with others think what it is that we as Southern Baptists believe because if we start doubting any portion of the Bible we just will close the doors and never come back here for a worship service first and foremost the Bible because that's what introduces us to Jesus that's what opens the door to salvation and eternity in heaven and if anyone wants to debate that with you I would encourage you to just simply say that's your belief I know truth and walk away walk away let's pray Father this morning I know that every person in this room has made a profession of faith and I'm so thankful for that the God around us there is a world of people who don't know you people who are lost People who will never ever find you without someone opening that door. Someone who says, come and come listen to me for just a few moments. Let me share the words of my Heavenly Father with you. And Father, I pray that when those opportunities are there, that we would have the courage to start in Genesis and take them all the way to Revelation and never doubt in a single word. God, because we know your word is true. We know the promises that you have fulfilled for us. The gifts you have given us. The number of people who would talk about the answer prayer that are in our midst today. God, we would take hours just to, to respond to those. So why should we doubt? We know the truth you give us. And we thank you for that. That is our foundation. That is our cornerstone. That is our building block. Everything begins with that. And we're so grateful that you give us your word. Lord, for those who are out there in the world who encounter those who doubt, I pray you would equip them. I pray you would give them the specific words that would remove the, 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 the drapes, the, the shades that have been pulled over the eyes. That you would help remove the darkness that is clouding the hearts of those who don't know you. God, we have so much work to do. But without this tool, we are totally lost. Thank you for equipping us as you send us out into the world in your name. God, how we love you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand.